பத்தஞ்சு முறுக்கு மந்த்ரா கடல் எண்ணெயில நானே பண்ணுது ஒரு சேலஞ்ச் உங்களால இந்த மாதிரி முறுக்கு செய்ய முடியுமா மந்த்ரா கடல் எண்ணெயில முறுக்கு செஞ்சு பாருங்க ஓகே வணக்கம் கோயம்புத்தூர் it's such an honor and a privilege to be here i would like to thank the organizers especially sudarshan ji vidya ji smriti ji and voice of kovai for having me here but i have to start by saying that the weather men are wrong again they were saying that a storm is going to hit these parts yesterday wrong storm is coming in 15 minutes storm in the form of annamalai not pengal and like rock stars you know when rock stars come in the concerts you have people who fill in so i'm just filling in for annamalai when he comes in <laughs> but uh, it is such a pleasure uh, to be here uh, and amongst friends and uh, people who would want to see this country prosper uh, but i did say and i i repeat out here i warn sudarshan ji that if he is calling me please be aware that i am always invited only once to any place uh very recently uh, there was a, a event held in kolkata about uh, media as a watchdog and i went there and there was a debate and i said uh, what are you talking about media as a watchdog media is a lapdog you know you guys are slaves of politicians and especially in bengal i mean you are basically uh, serfs who publish whatever you are commanded to publish you take money for from politicians to publish that you are ordered to not publish some things and you don't publish that you are not a watchdog you are a lapdog and the worst culprit is the newspaper telegraph and i didn't know the debate was sponsored by telegraph so i ran uh, with breakneck speed to the airport and people were telling me sir you are now about uh, because mamata banerji is land so 10 minutes away from the flight sir 5 minutes away from the flight luckily i made it back uh, very recently uh, there was an event at university in delhi uh, which was titled politics and beyond and i went there and uh, i said look when my turn came aren't we all tired of bashing the politicians day and night that's all we seem to be doing all the time i think we have to graduate from there and start bashing the people who need a bit of bashing and that's the judiciary because if there is one pillar of democracy that is nearly crumbled and we don't talk about it for fear it is the judiciary 5 crore pay- cases are pending that's more than the population of south korea you have in india only 20 judges per million population in america it's 200 judges per million population 38% of all high court judicial positions are lying vacant overall 21% of all indian judicial positions are lying vacant it's a calamity nine supreme court judges have said that there is intense corruption in the judiciary you have nepotism you have the collegium system where judges don't want democratically to be elected what are you talking about you have cases that are pending 150000 cases that are pending more than 30 years 190000 cases are rape and poxo cases it's just collapse it's not collapsing and amid that you have for example some high courts like the punjab and haryana high court where 32% of all the judges are related to the judicial people who are working in the same court this is a calamity and nobody is talking about it this is the uh part of democracy that should be criticized and we should be outraged upon and then my turn finished and i went back to the dais and the person sitting next to me was the chief justice of labad high court i forgot that i had brought my car i ordered uber and ran from there so sudarshan ji i have warned you already this might be the last time i'm called here be that as it may i want to spend the next hour in talking about things that are i believe very important to all of us uh it's a very wonderful title that has been kept uh, awake arise assert the problem in our country is and i want to talk about that is those who assert are not awake 
and those who are awake do not assert. And I believe for the next one hour, I want to talk about people who are awake and assert, but do not arise. And I think that's a big problem. Uh, at the heart of it is this question, what are the fundamentals of success? And if we are to become a developed country by 2047, which is the target we've set 100 years after modern India gained its independence, then there are some things that we need to recognize. And the primary among them is to recognize what are the fundamentals of what we call success. And this is a problem because as the adage goes, success hides failure. So people who get success don't want to talk about their failures. And if those people are politicians, then they never ever talk about their failures. When was the last time you heard a politician talking about a failure? I mean, in India, you have a politician who got 99 seats and he's behaving as if he's got 19 out of 100 seats. So everyone's successful. But the problem is, unless we identify what are the fundamentals that drive a person or a country to success, we are always going to be doubtful whether our glass is half empty or half full or brimming. We all want the glass to be brimming. That said, it is also true that for those asking for fundamentals of success to be defined, they should also judge whether we have been a success or not. And if you look at our progress over the last 75 years, I would say, give or take a few, we've been relatively successful. Let me give you a few parameters when we gained independence in 1947, our life expectancy was 32 years. Today it is 76 years. From 32 years, life expectancy to 76 years. So yes, we've been a success. In 1947, our literacy rate was 12%. Today it is upwards of 86%. When we gained independence in 1947, our poverty rate was 71%. Today, it is 4.5%. And the most troubling statistics is that when we gained independence in 1947, our infant mortality rate was 160. That is, 160 babies died before they could attain an age of one year out of 1,000 babies. Today, it is 24%. And in many, in 24 and in many states, it is approaching the level of Western European countries. In Kerala, it is six. So yes, we've been a relative success, no doubt about it. And if you were to scrunch the timeline even further from 75 years to 10 years, I would say we've been a stunning success. Let me give you a few para parameters. In 2014, for example, 29% of Indian population was multidimensionally poor. That is the metric that is used nowadays to define what poverty is. Health, wealth, so many other parameters go into it. Drinking water, air, everything, housing. Right now, only 11% of our population is multidimensionally poor. In the last 10 years, we have pulled 250 million Indians out of multidimensional poverty. In 2014, our GDP per capita was 1,500 US dollars. Today it is 2,500 US dollars. 10 years ago, our foreign exchange reserves were 300 billion dollars. Today they are 705 billion dollars, more than double. So many other parameters. In 2014, we had 74 airports. Today we have 148 airports. In 2014, five cities had metros. Today 20 cities have metros. 10 years ago, 21,000 kilometers of railway lines were electrified. Today, it is 63,000. 10 years ago, before 60 years, before that, the length of the highways that we have built in the last 10 years, we have built half of those. It's just spectacular. 10 years ago, our electronics exports were $7 billion. Today, it's $23 billion. So many others and those who are into finance, in this audience would 
appreciate this. 10 years ago, our assets under management, mutual funds were 9 lakh crores. Today, they are 63 lakh crores. 10 years ago, the most interesting data, the youngsters in the audience would appreciate, we had 350 startups. Today, we have 118,000 startups. So yes, from relative success from 75 years to stunning success in the last 10 years. And if we were to scrunch the timeline even further, not 75, not 10, but 1, then we've been a spectacular success. Let me give you a few parameters. Our monthly GST collections are the highest ever, 2.1 lakh crores. Number of vehicle sales, highest ever, 4.1 million units. Exports, highest ever, 780 billion dollars. Manufacturing PMI index, highest ever 59.1. Number of jobs created, highest ever at 47 million. Number of income tax returns, highest ever at 68 million. Inflation is at a five-year low of 3.5%. Of, it's written in the, risen in the last one month, but I'm talking about last one year. Our central government debt to GDP ratio is a five-year low of 53.5%. So many other data. For example, our Gini coefficient 0.4 inequality that measures is at a five-year low of 0.4. And the most spectacular, our stock exchange has been the highest ever at 83,000. So from relative success to stunning success in the last 10 years to spectacular success in the last one year, it's been a journey. So many among you would be talking, what's this guy talking about? Well, always a pessimist, you know. Glass is not half empty, glass is not half full, glass is brimming. But then I ask if that is the case, then why is it that even today, 300 million Indians live on 60 rupees a day? Why is it that even today, 150 million Indian children are out of school? Why is it that 8 million children are child labor? Why is it that 18 million Indians are bonded labor? Still, why is it that 34% of all Indian children under five are chronically stunted and malnourished? Why is it that 20% of all poor children have never been vaccinated? Why is it that 70% of India is without network connectivity? Why is it that only 2% of adult Indians pay income tax? In the UK, it is 66%. Why is it that we are ranked 111 out of 125 countries in the hunger index? And why is it that our rank in GDP per capita is 136th below even Sri Lanka and until a few months ago, Bangladesh? So clearly there are things that are spectacularly right and there are things that are spectacularly wrong. And unless we realize why these things are not being corrected or why these things have become wrong, I'm afraid we will always be, as the title of my talk goes, be walking on a treadmill and never progress onto travel later. You see, the thing with treadmill is that if you do not show the lower portion, it gives the impression that you're walking towards some place. But of course, your displacement is zero. You're all huffing and puffing, but going nowhere. And I don't want this to be the case for our beloved country going forward, because all of us love India. And we've had this inflection point even before. And we truly are at an inflection point that comes once a generation. Sometimes it even skips a generation, comes once in two generations. The last inflection point I remember was 1990, before economic liberalization. So we are at an inflection point. We are ready to take off. But I don't want us to be in a plane all set. And the pilot taxiing on the runway and says, ladies and gentlemen, there is a snag and I would have to park the plane at a hangar. I don't want that situation to be there again because we faced that before. And I believe unless we identify what is it that goes wrong, we will not be able to correct it and increase the quotient of our spectacular and stunning successes. And I believe why we are at this level still on the treadmill, not progressing on to travel later, is, is because we are confused as a state and as a people. And I'll 
over the next 40, 45 odd minutes. I want to talk about this confusion because this is vital for us to realize what this confusion is. A lot of us do not understand what this confusion is that the state is facing, shrouded in, and perhaps equally importantly, that we as citizens are. So I want to begin by asking a question. According to you, if I were to ask which is that one government or state policy that has helped our nation grow economically the fastest, what would be your answer, sir, everyone? Just one economic policy. Liberalization, yes, absolutely true. Without liberalization, we wouldn't be where we are right now. Anybody else? GST, yes, absolutely. Yes. Somebody likes tax out here. Let me call Nirmala Sitaraman, yes. Somebody loves tax. Yes, digital, digital India, no doubt about it. It's helped a country enormously. Manufacturing, sir, absolutely right. So many others, infrastructure, highways I talked about, electrification, railways, airports. Did you, did you see one thing that is common? All of you have given the right answers, all of you. But all your answers are concerning finance and economics. Somebody talked about economic liberalization. Somebody talked about GST, digital India. Everything is to do with economy and finance. What if I were to tell you? that the one state government policy that has helped this country grow the most has got nothing to do with economics or finance at all. It is the midday meal scheme. Every day, 130 million Indian children go to school. Every single day, 130 million Indian children go to school so that they can get education and they can get a meal, nutritious meal, that is mandated by the Supreme Court to be minimum of 430 kilocalories every single day. And that is the one policy, in my opinion, that has helped this country grow the most. And you know the person who thought of it and implemented it? K. Kamraj, belonging to this land, never went to school. So next time all of us think, oh, we need a politician who's an undergraduate or a graduate or a doctor or an engineer, because he is the one who is going to take our country forward, think again. He was one man who came up with this scheme, implemented it, never went to school. And because of him, this country is where it is right now in terms of growth and finance. And that right there should be the role of the state. The role of the state, the role of the state, oops, sorry. The role of the state is to create a labor force that is healthier, wealthier, wiser, and more adaptable, more flexible. That is all. The role of the state is not to use that workforce, which is what we've been doing, which is what the state has been doing. States cannot run businesses. States cannot employ workforces. And this right here is the problem, the confusion. The state wants to create a workforce and then use it. The issue is the state should only be confined to creating that workforce. We right now have a workforce or a labor force of 600 million Indians. 600 million Indians are the people who are taking this country where it is going and it should be going. And I want to put it to you over the next time that I have. Delineate this role that I believe far from fulfilling, the state is actually not taking on the responsibility. So when I talk about our workforce or labor force being healthier, wealthier, wiser, and more adaptable, let's go one by one and talk about what the situation is right now at present. Let's talk about a more adaptable, flexible workforce. India has a workforce of 585 million to 600 million people. 44% of that workforce is involved in agriculture. 44% is involved in a sector that contributes only 14 to 14 and a half percent to the GDP. It is a calamity. It is not a calamity going to strike us. It has already struck us. In the Western countries, 
only 2 to 3% of the workforce is involved in agriculture even in middle income economies it's not more than 3 3.5% right now we have for 250 to 300 million indians almost 44% of our workforce is involved in agriculture from production to purchase everything is medieval it's a humongously loss making sector but the state continues to have so many people involved in this sector Let's split this sector down because I think this is important. I want to talk about this confusion. This is the biggest confusion that envelops the state into where things are produced and what is produced. When we begin with talking about where things are produced in this sector, let me tell you 70 million hectares of Indian agricultural land, that's almost 40% of our available agricultural land has been damaged in the last six years because of floods or drought. 40%. And here we are talking about making agriculture an economically viable sector. Everything is wrong. We have 81% of farmers and cropland not insured. 110,000 farmers have committed suicide in the last 10 years. Can you name even a single sector? where so many people have died or committed suicide because of abject misery. I can't. And you talk of land, when you talk of other means, for example, 35% of our agriculture is still dependent on rain, on elements. This is the pathetic situation we are in. Let's talk about what we are producing. India is the world's second largest producer of sugarcane. Every year, we produce 500 billion kilograms of sugarcane. The amount of water, as you know, sugarcane is an intensely water-intensive guzzling crop. The amount of water that is required to grow this is not an issue that should be concerning one or two people. It should be concerning one or two billion people. Sugarcane requires only 7.2% of arable land but 76% of the irrigable water. The amount of water required to produce 500 billion kilograms of sugarcane is one quadrillion liters every year. I didn't even know what quadrillion means. I thought things finished at trillion. So I calculated for you. That's the amount of water that is present in 10 Ganga Sagar dams. That is the water we use to grow 500 billion kilograms of sugarcane. And sugar prices, they have halved in the last six years. The state doesn't care. The state wants to give more and more what is the MSP equivalent of sugarcane to, to farmers. The state, the political parties puts it in their, put it in their manifesto. We are proud to increase, to keep on procuring sugarcane from the farmers. We simply do not have enough water to grow sugarcane. We have the water availability per capita. It has shrunk by 50% in the last 40 years from 2,800 cubic meters to less than 1,200 cubic meters. United Nations says the water availability per capita required for civilized living is 1,700 cubic meters. So we are officially uncivilized right now. But let me talk about the waste of water for growing a crop that we simply do not need. We have the example of sugarcane. Now, one chief minister thought about this and said this is unacceptable. That person hopefully will be becoming a chief minister in another two, three days' time. I'm talking of Devendra Fadnavis. First time round when he was the chief minister, he said, we cannot afford to grow sugarcane. It is killing us. A, we don't need sugarcane. And B, it is completely destroying our ecosystem, our water. Everything is gone. So from now on, anyone who wants to grow sugarcane has to take government permissions. Now you know what government permissions are like. So it's better to not grow it rather than take government permission. That was a great step. But in three months, he had to renege on that policy. I won't name the politician, another Maharashtra politician known as Sugar, Sugar Baron. We've given him Padma Award. He has sugar industry in his pocket because of liquor industry. Molasses is one of the important byproducts of sugarcane. That order had to be rescinded. This is what the state is doing. It's playing with the lives of not just India or Indians. It is playing with everyone without us even knowing what the confusion is. Did you, for example, know 
that in Latur, four or five years ago, we were growing, we were taking water trains to Latur because of intense drought there. Politicians were cutting ribbons. They were delighted that they are actually taking water trains. It, it was a shameful exercise. We should have linked rivers to these places. In fact, talking of river linking, Supreme Court has mandated we must link 30 rivers. So many policies have been committed to on river linking for the last 20, 25 years. This idea has been going on. But not a single project has been completely implemented. 3,200 billion cubic feet of Godavari water in monsoon goes to the ocean. What is the water requirement for the entire state of Tamil Nadu? 1,800 billion cubic feet. 3,200 goes. 78% of river water goes into the ocean every monsoon. Is the state thinking about this? No. We are just not concerned about what is going to happen. Forget about 2047 in the next 10 years, 10, 15 years. It's not that we have not done much about it. Yes, we had Narmada Dam, one of the largest and biggest and greatest Indian projects, engineering feats. Right now, Narmada Dam gives electricity to 1.4 million homes, irrigates 2.4 million hectares of agricultural farmland, and gives tap water or water drinking water to 33 million homes. But did you know that it took 55 years for us to make Narmada Dam to what it is today? This is the length to which we go by formalizing and fructifying projects that are needed not for after 50 years, but after five years. This is the confusion. I talked about where things grow. Let's talk about what are the things that we are producing. India produces 4,000 kilograms per hectare of rice. That is one of the lowest quantities of rice that you can go per hectare. In countries traditionally known as rice producing like Vietnam, Thailand, etc. It is half of what they produce what we are producing. When it comes to maize, it is 25% of what the maximum output can be per hectare. And of what we produce, 70 million tons of Indian food goes waste every year. 30% of all the fruits and vegetables that we grow go waste. 30%. And whatever we have, it is laden with poison. India is the world's second largest producer of chemical pesticides. 60,000 tons of chemical pesticide is used every year. Every year, 30,000 Indians die of pesticide. Our Export refusal rate is one of the highest in the world. It is seven times that of China. Food export refusal rate by America. Are we concerned about it? No, we aren't. We produce 320 million tons of food grains every year. 145 million tons is our storage capacity. It's less than 50% of what we can store, but we keep on producing it. Three things would have changed all this. And who brought those three things? Narendra Modi. Those were the three farm reforms that were required. That would have catapulted this country to a middle income economy within a decade and a half. The greatest reforms of independent India were brought in by Modi. And what happened? The moment he brought it, the whole country went into an uproar. But it's not the fact that the whole country went into an uproar. You expect hypocrisy from politicians, especially from the opposition side. But the fact of the matter is that all these three farm reforms were verbatim in the election manifesto of each and every one of those opposition parties, especially the Congress party. What were these three farm reforms? That henceforth, the first one, the farmers will be given a choice to be able to sell the produce wherever they want to either in a government mandi like APMC or in a private marketplace. This is exactly what you want the businesses to do. Somewhere along the line, because of Manoj Kumar's songs, Mere Desh Ki Dharti Sona Ogle, we've forgotten that agriculture and farmers are businessmen primarily. We treat our businesses as businesses and we work towards them. Easy ease of business. When was the last time we thought of ease of agriculture? Why shouldn't the farmer be allowed to sell his or her produce wherever he wants to. That was the first farm reform. The second farm reform was to do away with the emergency provisions of the Essential Commodities Act. You see, what used to happen was that through a bureaucratic speak, 
suddenly the word storage would be converted to holding and a non bailable warrant be issued against the person who had produced that so as a result no businessman worth his or her salt would be willing to make these 24 hour working state of the art go downs where farmers could keep or store their agricultural perishable produce all year round because suddenly you are storing something and the government decides though no, you're not storing any longer you're holding it you're a thief you need to be arrested so the emergency provisions of national commodities act were to go and the third farm reform was contract farming that the farmers are to be freely approached by any business person to be asked to grow whatever they want to purchase that is the bedrock and the fundamental of how economics works you are supposed to have a world of supply and demand you are supposed to go to a person to ask him look i will buy this produce if you make this produce and the person will say decide well i want to do it or i don't want to do it these three farm reforms would have catapulted this sector where 250 to 300 million indians are involved this was crying out for reforms and the moment modi brought it because he brought it all hell broke loose suddenly overnight the same opposition parties that had demanded these reforms said these are black laws the whole nation came to a standstill the capital of the republic of india was held under siege five highways were blocked for a year the financial loss that the country incurred was 3500 crores every day for a whole year did the state bother about it was any compensation paid and after a year the farm laws were repealed it was the saddest day i remember november 19 2021 saddest day of independent india in our history that we bowed down to street veto to street violence that a few million middlemen held to ransom all pillars of our republic the fact of the matter is that each one of those kisan unions and agricultural minister during the congress rule the government there wanted these reforms but it's not a question of their hypocrisy or a question of their continued confusion over what their role should be. Politicians are by nature hypocritical. If you were to do a blood test instead of cholesterol, you will get hypocrisy. <laughs> what disappointed me most was that what I thought was still a pillar of democracy that is still standing the judiciary, that capitulated. Because the Supreme Court asked, all we see are the protesters, those who are against the farm laws, those 2 million people, where are the people who are for the farm laws? That was the saddest comment I had heard in decades. Because what did the Supreme Court want? That 200, 250 million farmers who are doing their farming in far from areas of Kerala, Tamil Nadu, in Coimbatore, in Pondicherry, in Odisha, in Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, drop whatever they're doing catch the nearest bus or train or bullock cart or whatever it may be bus and go travel all the way to supreme court sit outside and say we are for we are for the farm laws is that how democracy works no that is how anarchy works and a week after supreme court stayed those supreme court's own instituted committee came out with the findings that 82 percent of all farmers and farm lobbies were for the farm laws but the farm laws were repealed. No compensation was paid. No reason was given. This is the confusion that shrouds us. But this is just one sector. Maybe things are better in another low-hanging fruit sector where a lot of people are to be involved. Let's talk about tourism. Now, tourism, let me give you one example. Just one city of the world, Paris, just one city, takes in 25 million foreign tourists every year. One city, 25 million foreign tourists. One country, India, 1.4 billion people, takes in 11 million foreign tourists. One city, Paris, 25 million. India, 11 million. Only 30 million Indians are directly employed in the tourism sector. It should be five times that. It's the lowest hanging fruit. Tourism as a sector contributes only 2.5% to our GDP. It should be five times that. We have an 8,000 year old civilization. We have a culture that has hundreds of languages, hundreds of cuisines from 
snow beach mountains to beaches to deserts to greenery to forests to reservoirs to reserves what is it that we don't have to showcase we have 42 world heritage sites and yet only 11 million tourists greece has half those world heritage sites and yet greece attracts three times as many foreign tourists as we do this is a situation of tourism sector we have bodh gaya bodh gaya should be the vatican of the east we have 535 million buddhist population around the world bodh gaya is where lord buddha attained nirvana enlightenment and yet the annual municipal budget of bodh gaya is less than the production budget of the failed movie adi purush 500 crores we have bodhi tree under which lord buddha attained nirvana countries would be falling over each other to make bodh gaya as the vatican of the east south korea japan china but only 0.25 million tourists visited the bodhi tree what is the buddhist population 535 million the sun temple at peru attracts 1.9 million tourists the sun temple at konark attracts 9000 1.9 million 9000 this is the situation of tourism sector something has to be done but what a small country like uae has more hotel rooms than india we have 0.2 million hotel rooms china has 100 times that 20 million hotel rooms in china and of whatever sector that we have we have for example a restaurant you pay 5% gst but if that restaurant is in a hotel that has rooms you suddenly pay 18% gst businessmen are crying out for reforms the finance minister acknowledges it he says the return on investment on tourism is too low but why is it too low it's because we somehow consider only universities and dams as temples of modern india hotels are the temples of modern india businessmen have to be encouraged this is the best way to showcase our country 8000 year old culture and people realize it's not that people didn't realize prime minister modi realized said we need skills we need skill indians so he came up with this skill india policy in 2014 15 the target was we'll have 400 million indians skilled by 2022 2022 came and went how many indians were skilled 14 million target 400 million skilled 14 million india has an apprenticeship act since the time of jawaharlal nehru 1961 because people realize in order for us to skill people you need them to be apprentices guru shishya but we have only 0.5 million apprentices in our labor force of 585 million indians there is a 60 percent gap in the supply and demand of the labor that we need in the tourism sector what are we doing about it i'll tell you what we're doing about it the government is running 495 hotels all of them are loss making and all of them earn revenue only after elections when politicians have to be ferried from one hotel to the other what's the government doing running hotels why is it running loss making hotels this is the confusion that surrounds us because we are not plucking the low hanging fruit we are watching it rot and that's the tragedy that is the confusion of the state and that is where we are not involved in making our labor force more adaptable more flexible those millions of people who should be doing something that is giving more return to their investment to the investment of the state i talked about this aspect let me quickly come to the other aspect because without a wiser labor force very little is possible so do we have a wise, how do we fare in that we have 1.1 million teachers vacancy less teachers than we need in school there is a 19 percent vacancy as far as teachers are concerned in some states the pupil to teacher ratio is 60 to 1 8% of all Indian schools are single teacher school. There is 25% teacher absenteeism rate. 40% of all rural schools do not have a functional toilet. That's why parents are wary of sending their children to these schools, especially girl child. We have a situation 
where 21% of all high school students are dropouts. We have a situation where 43% of all high school Indian students cannot do a simple subtraction addition sum. We have a situation where 52% of all Indian high school students cannot string a sentence in English. This is the situation of our schools. Maybe the universities are better. All those tens, hundreds of millions of school children when they go to universities, how do our universities fare for a wiser workforce? We have only 1100 universities to cater to those tens of hundreds of millions of students. None of those universities are in the top 200 universities of the world in the most established mids. We have a gross enrollment rate of only 25%. The government itself has shut down 800 engineering colleges because the government said they're simply not teaching engineering. God knows who set them up. This is the situation that the state and the education sector is involved in. 53% of all Indian graduates are unemployable. Not unemployed, unemployable. They don't have the requisite skills to be employed. 80% of all Indian engineers are unemployable. This is the situation we are dealing with. In year 2000, 33% of all unemployed were graduates. Today, 66% of all unemployed are graduates. And you know what the tragedy is as we look towards 2047? That half of Indian population is below 25 years. Half. 92% of all youth have access to smartphone. And yet we have this situation. Sadly, we seem to have missed the bus. This e-learning could have catapulted us without need for making brick and mortar universities to create a, a wiser workforce. Let me come to the third aspect of a wealthier workforce because ultimately what matters is if our workforce is wealthy, it can use that money to become wealthier, to contribute more to the welfare of the country and to the economy. How do we fare there? Well, to be honest, one of the things that endeared me to our Prime Minister Narendra Modi was what he said in 2013, which is that a government has no business to be in business. And I said, here is a man, here is a leader who's finally got it, that a government has no business to be in business. Governments do not run, cannot run businesses. Every state that has had a government that has run businesses, not only that business has gone bankrupt, not only that government has gone bankrupt, but that state has gone bankrupt. From Soviet Union to Venezuela to Cuba to North Korea to wherever you will. Governments cannot run things. The purpose of the government is to create a workforce so that you, the wealth creators, can run things. But unfortunately, in the last 10 years, all what the Modi government has done is to be in the business of running businesses. We have 1830 public sector units. 400 of them are non-functional. They're not making what they're supposed to be making, and yet tens, possibly lakhs of crores of our money, taxpayer money, goes in propping them up. You think I'm kidding? 21% of our annual budget allocation, that is 9 lakh crores, goes in propping up these public sector units. 21%. Are we even bothered about it? Is the state even bothered about it? When we talk of the loss-making things that the state is involved in, I talk about 495 hotels that the state is running. Why is the state running telephony companies? BSNL, MSNL. Every two or three years, there is a capital infusion of 3 lakh crores, 4 lakh crores. Banks. What is the state doing running banks? We have a collective NP of public sector banks of 10.6 lakh crores. Most of it is written off to show it the books are good, not waved off. If it is waved off, it is waved off for good, but written off, at least the government claims, well, we'll get it back. But here is the thing. Hardly 10% of it has actually been brought back in the last five years. The other 9 lakh crores is just written off. But why is the government running banks? The banks were run privately until Indira Gandhi nationalized it. In fact, the Supreme Court overturned that, barred it, but she overturned the Supreme Court judgment. Banks were nationalized. And you know why they were nationalized? Because then the money is at the beck and call of the politician. And since 1970s, when the banks were nationalized, 
every politician has been using it as a tap to demand money to be paid or a loan to be given to whoever he or she may like. And that is the reason why all these banks are loss making. But nobody is correcting it. Every year, 87,000 crores is lost by public sector banks in terms of fraud. Nobody worries about this. Why? Is this how you would create a wealthier labor force? Is this how you would create something that this nation has to be proud of? You have the nation employing 20 lakh crores in terms of its resources for public sector. Why is so much being invested in something which is hopelessly loss-making? If the public sector is like this, perhaps the government allows the private sector to run well. Perhaps it does. Well, let us look at the data. A MSME, a small MSME, medium enterprise that employs 150 Indians has to spend on average 18 lakhs every year in filing returns and compliances. 18 lakhs an average MSME. India has 69,000 compliances. Every year you have to be committed to 6,600 filings. And I've calculated this. It's an average filing of one every working day, every hour. So for all those businesses who've been listening to this talk, after an hour you would have missed a filing. That's the situation we have. We have the top five state GDP producing states, Gujarat, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Maharashtra, Uttar Pradesh. They have thousand laws that carry prison sentences. Businesses. Did you know, according to Factories Act 1948, which is still valid, if you do not have a spittoon in your factory, you can be liable to be arrested. This is the situation of the private enterprise. Unless the state lifts this confusion, it is running businesses that it should not be running. It should just be creating people to be used, labor force to be used by the people who are good at running businesses. Fair enough if they run into a loss. But then that's the problem, not the onus of the government. Let me come to the final aspect of what the role of the state should be. To create a healthier labor force. Now, of course, out of all the four, this is the most important. Because unless, as the age goes, health is wealth, Unless you have a healthier labor force, nothing else is possible. You will not have the labor force working, creating wealth, or be wiser, being educated. And no doubt about it, this country, especially I gave you some data in the last 10 years, has made enormous strides as far as health is concerned. I talked about infant mortality rate. I talked about so many other things, so many lives being saved through health. You have the Ayushman Health Card that now 380 million Indians are recipient of that talks about insurance. 68 million Indians have been treated through those cards. That's more than the population of United Kingdom. One billion Indians were vaccinated twice over within a year by Narendra Modi. According to me, that is our greatest achievement since independence. So we've made great strides in the health sector. No doubt about it. But then we are not looking at 2026 or 2027, we're looking at 2047. The thing with health is you have to look at the future. How do we fare there? And to give you an idea, to give you a perspective, I talk about <laughs> not at all.
பிளீஸ் அனைவருக்கும் வேண்டுகோள் தயவு செய்து நீங்க அமைதி காத்து உங்களுடைய இருக்கையில் அமர்ந்தானா திரு ஆனந்த ரங்கநாதன் ஜி அவர்கள் அவருடைய உரையை தொடர்ந்து ஆற்ற முடியும் தயவு கூர்ந்து எங்களுக்கு ஒத்துழைக்குமாறு அன்போடு கேட்டுக்கொள்கிறோம் sorry for the interruption so there are only two people i don't mind interrupting me my wife and annamalai <laughs> in in that order <laughs> but a great welcome to annamalai and now we've all been waiting for you and uh, it's an absolute pleasure and an honor to be in the same hall as you thank you so much anna so as i was saying uh i'm sorry i've kind of forgotten where i was yes uh talking about healthier workforce now indian council of medical research uh in 2020 brought out very fascinating revealing pie charts they wanted to look at the kind of diseases that afflict indians in 1990 and the kind of diseases that inflict us now so they found out in 1990 before economic liberalization 70% of the diseases that afflicted indians were communicable diseases and 30% were non communicable diseases so communicable diseases like tuberculosis malaria cholera viral diseases um uh, mrsa hospital infection diseases and that was quite logical because we were a poor country then we lived in cramped conditions our water was contaminated air was contaminated we lived in less houses uh we had for example household pollution one of the biggest causes so only 30% of the diseases that afflicted us were non communicable diseases the so called western diseases like heart ailments asthma diabetes uh cancer 30 years later the pie chart it has completely flipped in 2020 70% of the diseases that afflict indians are now non communicable diseases and only 30% are communicable diseases in fact they are going to go down even further so in in 1990 3 million uh, patients had malaria now only 40000 in 1990 1.8 million indians died of tuberculosis now it is quarter of that so we've made huge strides as well as non communicable or communicable diseases are concerned but with increasing wealth and prosperity with economic liberalization and wealthier indians we've had this tsunami of communicable diseases and non communicable diseases i beg your pardon and it's not just a tsunami that is waiting to overwhelm us the tsunami is already here and the state does not even realize that it is here leave alone the people indians don't realize we have 215 million indians who are right now clinically obese think of that we talk of india is a poor country in the west people say eat this because there are people in india who cannot even get this 215 million indians are clinically obese 330 million indians have blood pressure issues under 50 we have the world hub for cancer cases and of diabetes 150 million indians are confirmed pre diabetic that's more than the population of france and united kingdom 100 million indians are confirmed diabetic we have no idea that the tsunami is here 100 million indians are diabetic where is that drug has the state constructed this drug a billion trillion dollar selling drug that would cure diabetes that would cure non communicable diseases heart ailments india is the hub for it where is that drug are we demanding of this and here i would like to take a show of hands how many among you know who lakshmi kutti is lakshmi kutti okay three hands have gone up Six months ago, I would have been in the same boat. Even I did not know who Lakshmi Kutti was. Let me tell you who Lakshmi Kutti is. Lakshmi Kutti is an 85-year-old frail woman who spent all her life in the forests of the Western Ghats, and all she has done is have this collected this library of 500 medicinal plants that she uses to treat tribals and forest dwellers. 
and Lakshmi Kutti came into prominence four years ago because the government decided to give her a Padma for her contribution. And Lakshmi Kutti came bare feet to Rashpati Bhavan and she said, this is too much opulence, I'm not used to, it, used to it. And after a week, she went back. We should be having, state should be having 100 Lakshmi Kutti Institutes of Natural Products. We should be finding out each and active ingredient, single molecule in those medicinal plants. Some of those would be billion, trillion dollars selling anti-diabetes drug, anti-heart ailment, anti-asthma, anti-cancer. Are we doing this? No. We're just happy giving her a Padma and our job is done. And here I'd like another show of hands because if you believe this is a figment of my imagination, how many of you know who 2UU is? 2UU. One hand has gone up. That doesn't count because that's my wife's hand because I've already, she already knows this. So no cheating allowed. But again, I was in the same boat six months ago. Even I didn't know who to you. Let me tell you, to you, you just like Lakshmi Kutte is an 85-year-old frail woman. Chinese though. Just like Chai, uh, Lakshmi Kutte, she has dwelled all her life in the forest in China. Just like Lakshmi Kutte, she's been collecting these medicinal plants from the forest of China. But unlike Lakshmi Kutte, to you, you isolated the active ingredient of one of her medicinal plants. And that is the only medicine to cure malaria right now, artemisinin. And for that, to you, you got the Nobel Prize. And you know what will happen? Some scientist in far-flung Nordic country would decide, descend upon Western Ghats and meet Lakshmi Kutte and say, can I please have your library of medicinal plants? And Lakshmi Kutte being what she is, so generous and kind, she'll say, take it, take it all away. And they would take it to Sweden or Finland or Iceland or Norway or Denmark. And they would isolate the multi-billion dollar anti-diabetic drug, anti-cancer drug, and they would get the Nobel Prize. And at the Nobel Prize ceremony, they would thank Lakshmi Kutte and we'd be so grateful we would give her Bharat Ratna. This is how the state thinks. The state's responsibility begins and ends at being perfunctory, at being still shrouded in this confused role. But if I said that we have to understand what the role of the state is and how confused it is in having this labor force that should be healthier, wealthier, wiser, more adaptable. What is the confusion that surrounds us as a citizen? Don't we have an equal role to play? And I dare say we do. And let me in the next whatever little time I have tell you about the confusion that surrounds us, the citizens. Because let me tell you, let me be very honest. I am for a welfare state. I am for India being a welfare state. Because if India was not a welfare state, we would have wiped out or we would wipe out tens of millions of Indians. And nobody wants that. Nobody wants an island of prosperity in India amongst an ocean of misery. None of us want it. All of us want India to be prosperous as a country, not as gated communities. And in order for us to do that, welfareism is not just important, it is vital. So many would have died had Modi not built 120 million toilets. Did you know each new toilet built has saved that household health cost of 52,000 rupees? And a month ago it came out that 150,000 Indian infants have been saved because of new toilets being constructed. Did you know that 100 million gas connections that have been given by Modi under the Ujwala, 150,000 Indians' lives have been saved every year directly because of this. Because even I didn't know, the biggest cause for infant mortality is not some disease. It is household pollution. When you used to push and, you know, have that chula, that is what caused infant deaths. Welfareism is saving lives. There are so many other examples. Modi providing 110 million tap water connections. Did you know that under five diarrheal deaths have been slashed by half? You have 340 million, 350 million Ayushman cards been given. 68 million Indians being treated. You have 1 billion, as I said, Indians vaccinated twice over within a year. This is all what welfareism means. You have 430 million mudra loans been given to give independence, financial independence to Indians. 600 million bank accounts. I can go on and on. 
welfareism is important it is crucial but more crucial than that is that welfareism is possible only in a capitalist state not a socialist state you need to generate money in order then to spend it socialism or welfareism is possible not in a socialist economy and this right here is the problem i am for welfareism but i am not for freebism somebody has to draw that line between what is freebism and what is welfareism and unless we draw that line we as a citizen forget about the state we as a citizen are going staring down an abyss through which there is no escape now what is that line who will draw this a politician will never draw that line because for a politician and i don't include anna out here because for a politician every freebie is welfareism if he starts to define that line he won't be able to give any freebie but we have to draw that line and unless we draw the supreme court ask the politicians political parties draw the line they never drew that line three years have gone supreme court said tell us what is freebie what is welfare and it's hard unless you think about this it's very hard to draw that line because everyone has blurred that line but let me give you a stark example of the result of what happens when we don't draw this line let me have another show of hands i don't mean to be patronizing so please pardon me but how many of you raise your hands love your family of course all the hands have gone up right how many of you have families that are running in debt one hand has gone up 99% of you love your family and 99% of your families are not in debt let me take another show of hands again i apologize for being patronizing how many of you love india all the hands have gone some some communists are there they're not raising raise their hand but all of you raise your hands why is it then that you love your family and none of your families are under debt and you love india and yet you as a citizen are fine with india being under a debt of 254 lakh crores when are we going to wake up are you all fine with our debt being 254 lakh crores the state have a cumulative debt of 75 lakh crores somebody is going to pay this we are not america america has a debt of 40 trillion dollars it doesn't care because it can print money we don't have that luxury sooner or later somebody has to pay for this because there is no such thing as a free lunch and you know when all of you applauded when i said that 10 years ago we had 350 startups and today we have 118000 these are the startups that would be asked to pay up for this sooner or later the wealth creators would have to pay more and more tax to pay for this otherwise we're looking at another situation that we had in 1990 when our foreign exchange reserves were only 0.6 billion dollars there's 700 billion dollars now we had to mortgage 67 tons of our gold to the bank of england because we didn't have enough money are we going towards that situation all of us mocked rahul gandhi when he said this khatakat scheme of giving 1 lakh per year to all women we rightly so we mocked it but then you look at maharashtra recent elections the bjp did not just promise this they implemented giving 1500 rupees per month to every eligible maharashtrian woman age 21 to 60 costing the exchequer 50000 rupees 50000 crore every year and the incumbent chief minister said if voted to power i am going to double it that would have cost us upwards of 1 lakh crores every year what is the debt of maharashtra it's upwards of 7.5 lakh crores did anyone bother about this unless we bother about the debt we are in i am afraid it is a black hole out of which escape is impossible forget about 2047 even 2097 doesn't look very likely so what are these freebies how can one define it i myself have tried to define it and i'll tell you give you a few examples stark examples of what freebie is according to me according to me a freebie is welfareism that is conducted against national interests it is spending our money by governments and political parties and when they come to power on things that are blatant appeasement 
that is to win votes, to placate their vote bank. That, according to me, is freebie. And what is welfareism? Is our money spent on the kind of things that I talked about, saving lives, making us healthier, wealthier, more prosperous, more adaptable. Let me give you a few examples of what freebie are according to this definition. The first one, most obvious one. All governments and parties, when they say they will come to power, they have these free pilgrimages to senior citizens. Why? Why are you promising our money to senior citizens to go for free pilgrimage? What bother it is, concern is of the state, especially a so-called secular state where religion should be completely demarcated and differentiated from running the state. It's our money. You have Arvind Kejriwal, bless him, is for, uh, at least he was my state's chief minister. There is still a chair that is empty in case he wants to come back and sits. His, his soul and his atma travels around wherever every Delhi citizen goes. He promised every senior citizen free trip to Dwarka. Why? It's our money. Why are you spending it? Samajwadi Party promised to Ajmer Sharif. You have BJD promised to Jagannath Puri. You have Congress promises to, uh, uh, you know, so many temples in Kerala. And you have BJP who promised in Nagaland, senior citizens, free trip to Jerusalem. Forget about Ayodhya. They said, where is Jerusalem? I will take you to Jerusalem. It's our money. Why is the state giving Hajj subsidies? Tens of lakhs of crores for 60 years. Why is the state paying tens of thousands of Malvis and priests monthly salaries? This is a secular state. Why is the state giving interest-free loans to set up shops on Vakf land? It's our money. This is what classic, typical freebie is. Using our money to placate or appease a vote bank. Let me give you another example. Did you know in the last 10 years, the central government, BJP government, has spent 8,000 crores on government ads? Did you know that the Delhi government, state government of Kejriwal, has spent 1,200 crores in the last three years on government ads? Why? This is our money. And what are these ads? They are self aggrandizing They either wish each other politician happy birthday, or some anniversary, happy Children's Day, happy Mahatma, sorry, happy Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi Day. Uh, thank you. What for? These center spread huge mug shots of politicians wishing each other at our money. We don't even notice it. Every morning you read, flip a newspaper, wherever, whichever state you might be. Tens of thousands, lakhs of crores of our money is spent by our government that we elect on this freebism. And you know how damaging it is? Because they're not just spending the money, they're actually bribing the media. Media always runs these campaigns, moral and ethical campaigns. When was the last time you heard a media running a campaign against government ads? Never. They fight like cats and dogs to get that pie. And the government uses it as a tap. You print bad news against us, we're not going to give you government ads. You print good news against us, here is the bolus of money. This is the situation. I talked about tourism sector and how things are lacking there. Did you know our government budget for promoting Indian tourism abroad is only three crores? Three crores. That's equivalent of five full-page newspaper ads that every political party gives every day. That right there is freebie. You want another example, I'll give you. In 2005, celebrated, reputed economists Dr. Manmohan Singh and Dr. Montek Singh Aluwalia said this nation cannot go on with the kind of pension scheme it has. We will go bankrupt because in 1980, 2% of our revenue went in pensions. Now it is 20%, tenfold. So they came up with the new pension scheme that also held a contribution from the government side, I think 10 to 14%, and 10% or I think 14% from the employee side, as opposed to what is now called the old pension scheme that was prevalent then that had 50% of the last drawn salary and that was not taxable at all. But in 2022, another celebrated economist, Rahul Gandhi, he said, <laughs> why are you laughing? He is, <laughs> even Anna is laughing. <laughs> he said, if you vote us in power in Himachal Pradesh, I will junk the scheme brought in by my own party, Congress, and I will revert to the old pension scheme. Himachal had 1.3 lakh employees 
and 1.6 lakh pensioners. Congress won. We, the citizens, you, you elected Congress. And as a result, it wasn't a BJP leader who stood up. It was Montek Singh Aluwalia who stood up and said, you guys are going to go bankrupt. What have you done? This is the biggest ravedi. I'm quoting him. It wasn't PM Modi who used the word ravedi first. It was Montek Singh Aluwalia. The RBI said, don't do this. You are going to spend five times the amount of money that you were spending on NPS than on OPS. You will go bankrupt. Nobody listened. And what is happening right now, you have on the floor of the Himachal Assembly, the Chief Minister saying, we don't have enough money to pay salaries to our MLAs. They have mortgaged Himachal Bhavan in Delhi. They are taxing toilets. 77% of Himachal Pradesh's tax revenue is going in propping up this scheme. This is the situation when we as citizens don't realize what a freebie is and what welfare is. This is blatantly against national interest, use of our money to placate a vote bank to appease it. This has to stop, this confusion has to lift. Let me finish by talking about the mother of all fleabies. That leave alone the politicians, even the citizens don't bother because it feels we don't, it doesn't affect us. I talk about the minimum support price or the MSP. If ever there was a freebie, this is it. Now MSP is a Soviet era relic. This was in the 60s or 70s. You can say it was perhaps then required because our food grain capacity was 80 million tons every year. Now it is four times that, 320 million tons. And yet, the government keeps on procuring more and more. Now, pure economic tells you, economy tells you, economics tells you rather, that if the state decides to guarantee something, then the state is guaranteed to get that. The farmers will produce more and more of what the state wants, more and more. As a result, the farmers of Punjab, Haryana are growing more and more of food grains. We have 320 million tons of food grains. Our storage capacity is only 145 million tons. Half of it we cannot even store. Rats are eating it. The Food Corporation of India is under a debt of 3 lakh crores written by the government. Don't worry. Don't worry about the debt. When COVID struck, we did not have enough food grain to distribute because it was unedible. 8 million tons of food grain was unedible. We had to import it from Russia and Ukraine. And yet, every year, 2.5 to 3 lakh of money, of our money, is spent in giving farmers, in procuring this food grain that we don't need. Our buffer limit is set at maximum 41 million tons. It hovers around 25 to 23 million tons every year. Two years ago, we procured 100 million tons. We were 60 million tons above our buffer limit. It is insane. But nobody talked about it. Nobody protested. Those 60 million tons, because nobody had the guts to say no to farmers. We keep on giving them money. It is like Sarkari, Nokri, government jobs. And Rahul Gandhi said, we demand MSP on every agricultural produce. That is insane. The BJP rightly said. It's going to cost the exchequer 16 lakh crores over and above everything per lakh per year. We only have 45 lakh crores to spend. 9 lakh crores goes in PSU. 16 lakh for to go in MSP. Khayenge kya? BJP rightly condemned it. But then came the Haryana elections. And BJP guaranteed and promised exactly the same to Haryana farmers. Every agricultural produce of Haryana farmer, we guarantee an MSP. And what happened? BJP won. This is the situation. ICAIR has come up with a report that faulty MSP and other pricing of agricultural produce has costed the farmers in the last 16 years 45 lakh crores. 62% of the farmers are saying, please let us set the price. We don't want MSP. Only 6% of farmers are using MSP. But because it helps placate a vote bank, no government, no politician has the right to negate it. And if you believe that MSP doesn't affect you because we are coming from an economic socio strata that is not agriculture in its base, that is not going to affect us. We are middle class and we are urbans. Think again. Let me give you one example. What happened with government guaranteeing MSP? Incidentally, MSP was considered as the biggest reason for inflation by an advisor, current advisor of Rahul Gandhi, Raghuram Rajan. Because you keep on inflating every cost when you guarantee this produce, money for produce. But because of MSP, 
and because farmers had an incentive to grow only rice and wheat, they started growing only rice and wheat. And as a result, you know rice is an exceedingly water intensive crop. And what happened was that the water table of Punjab and Haryana went down alarmingly. And finally, the politicians were alarmed, alarmed enough to bring a law that said the rice sowing season has to be coinciding with the monsoon. We cannot afford the water table to go down any further. If rice is sown, it has to be irrigated by the elements or when the rain comes. So as a result, the rice harvesting was, uh, rice sowing was delayed. And as a result, rice harvesting also got delayed and it coincided with the onset of winter, which is right about now in Delhi, when the AQI of Delhi is upwards of 1,000. People cannot breathe in Delhi. 35 million tons of rice stubble is being burnt. 35 million tons. And when you talk about perspective, let me give you a perspective. 70,000 farm fires happened two years ago. The farmers have also learned to be clever. They wait to set their farm on fire after the NASA satellite has passed them over. Now the farms are set on fire after 2 p.m. Let me give you a perspective because it might not be very clear what farm fire actually means. An area of 17,900 square kilometers or 12 times the size of Delhi is on fire every year, every day for a month right next to Delhi. This is the calamity situation of air pollution that in Delhiites are breathing. And we think it's not going to affect us at all. The carbon dioxide emission through rice stubble burning is 149 million tons. The CO2 emission from the entire Indian transport is 270 million tons. 149 million tons is rice stubble burning completely avoidable. The amount of money we are spending on curing respiratory diseases as a result of rice stubble burning or breathing this foul air is 150 times more than the amount the governments would spend in buying the happy cedar machines that would take out in an eco-friendly way the rice stubble. $70 million, that is all that will cost. And what is the government ad budget of Punjab, Haryana and central government in the last five years? $1,300 million. That is why I say we are a banana republic ever since we became a republic. But ladies and gentlemen, we to banana republic se republic banana hai. And that is the situation where I want to end this. That unless we lift this cloud and shroud of confusion that has enveloped us as a state, that has enveloped us as a people, I'm afraid we are not going to reach where all of us love our beloved country and want us to reach. I shall end there. Thank you so much.